میزمال دوید ادونای راهی لوخ سر بینات شیار بیت سنیال ممنو خوت یا نخالینی نفشی یشو ویف یا نخینی و مغلت صدق لما انشمو גם כי חלך בגיד צול מוות, לא ירע כי אתה הימדי. שבתך על משענתך, המה ינח המוני. תערוך לפני שולחן נגד צוררי. תשנת ושמן ראשי כוסיר ויעל. אך טוב וחסד ידיפוני כל ימי חיי. Friends, I've just shared with you the words of our 23rd Psalm. In these moments when our hearts are breaking, when we are searching for shalom, for peace, for comfort, We find the strength to turn to the words of the psalmist, and so I invite you to recite these words with me as we say together. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He guideth me in straight paths for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod is. And thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou hast anointed my head with oil. My cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. In the rising of the sun and in its going down, we will remember him. In the blowing of the wind and in the chill of winter, we will remember him. In the opening buds and in the rebirth of spring, we will remember him. In the blueness of sky and in the warmth of summer, we will remember him. In the rustling of leaves and in the beauty of autumn, we will remember him. In the beginning of the year and when it ends, we will remember him. When we are weary and in need of strength, we will remember him. When we are lost and sick at heart, we will remember him. And when we have joys we yearn to share, we will remember him. So long as we live, he too will live, for he is now a part of us, as we remember David Case. To you, Karina, and to you, Ariella, And to David's parents, to Susan and Tom and to John and Kumsa, to his sisters, Sheila and Sarah, and also to Nissan, to his brothers, John and Dave, and his nieces and nephews, to Nathaniel, Johanna, Amalia, and Reuven, to all the members of the family and to so many dear and cherished friends, those of you who are with us in person, those of you who join us via live stream. In this sad moment, our hearts are joined together and are united as we remember, but also as we find the strength to celebrate the life of your beloved David. David entered into this world on November 22, 1977. His parents, Susan and John, along with his two older sisters, Sheila and Sarah, were living in Buffalo, New York at the time. Many moves later, including to New Haven, Connecticut, El Paso, Texas, the family finally settled in here in Cleveland when David was just 11 years old on Fairmont Boulevard in Shaker Heights. I have to say to David's parents, there are absolutely no adequate words today. 
There are no explanations that can be offered from any of us. We can't find the words when the order of nature has been reversed. I know that all of us here today can only pray that you feel the community and the love that surrounds you and your entire family in this moment. Susan, when we spoke yesterday, you shared with me memories of your blonde, curly-haired little boy whose very first words were, choo-choo. Apparently, there was a train that ran behind your home when you were living in Buffalo, and so choo-choo was the first thing he said. You shared memories with us as a son who was very outgoing and social, a son who made friends so easily and who also maintained those friendships. You recalled a son who in his youth and teen years was active into everything, be it soccer, baseball, swimming, skiing. And Susan, you remarked, and I'm quoting you, that you saw in your son a sweet little boy who grew up to be a wonderful man. Along his journey to manhood, David became bar mitzvah at the Temple to Fareth Israel. And in his school, in his studies, he was an excellent student, graduating with honors from Shaker Heights High School. He attended Hiram College, where he graduated cum laude. David went on to earn his Master's of Finance degree from Case Western Reserve University. He worked as the CEO of a custom software company as well. And you know, Karina, much more important to all of us than what David did to make a living is what he did to make a life. And so we're taught by our tradition that words which come from the heart are the words that enter directly to the heart. There are a number of members of the family who have words, stories, memories on their heart that they want to share with us today. And so I would like to first call on his sister, Sarah. Thank you all for being here. So when David was born, we lived in our house in Buffalo, and he loved to play with cars and trucks, and he would make realistic machine sounds. He had this favorite pillow. It was a, he called it puppy. It was um, like a flat silhouette that looked kind of like the shape of a puppy. It was um, gingham, check, um, of different colors. And um, he would comfort himself by cuddling with puppy, and he would put these two, I'm sorry, I'm going to do this a little odd, but he would do this. <laughs> like that, and he was so cute. And we, he would just cuddle up, and he would go to sleep. Um, in our copy of The Three Little Pigs, he scribbled out the big bad wolf, and he wrote, sorry again for this, he wrote, wolf is a poopy, <laughs> <laughs> to stop him from hurting the two little pigs, because we know the third little pig, um, you know, depending on the story, I think in that version, he ate the little pigs or whatever, so he stopped them. Um, he loved the Incredible Hulk. And he had him ironed onto his pillowcase. Like in those days in the 80s, we had a lot of iron-ons. And um, also was on his favorite cup, the Incredible Hulk. And he loved Popeye. And I remember he wanted to grow up and be big and strong. That might have been a phrase that um, maybe my parents would say to get him to eat or something like that. But I think that was what he would want to be. And I remember that. Um, when David was three and I was five, my sister was nine. We were playing with dough that my mom had made out of flour and water, and his fingers were all sticky with dough. So I remember I climbed up on the counter. I got the canister of flour, and we just added, he added, you know, the handfuls of flour. And m my sister and I said, David, do you remember any of the messes that we used to make when we were little? Of course, we didn't realize that we were little then, even though he was just three. And he shook his head. And with his long eyelashes and his blonde curls, he was absolutely so adorable. And um, he said no. So I said, let's make a big mess that we are going to remember. And 
he said, yeah, and he nodded his head. So um, we poured flour into a small bowl. We threw it in the air. Um, but the little cloud of fun it made wasn't big enough. So we dumped two white toy bins, one of trucks, one of instruments, all over the floor, everywhere. We poured the flour into the bins, and um, <laughs> we were cracking up. We took them, and he wanted me to dump it on his head. So I dumped it on his head, and then, of course, I wanted him to dump it on it. So he dumped it on my head. We dumped it on my sister. And he goes, you look like you have gray hair. And, and I said, oh, this is what we're going to look like when we're old. <laughs> okay. So when he was a new kid at Campus East in Buffalo, um, he introduced himself to his class like this. My name is David Michael Case. That's exactly how he said it, really fast, because in Buffalo, everyone talked really, really fast. Um, and he had a friend named David Brown. So it was David Brown and David Michael Case. And all of his friends said it that way, David Michael Case. Um, and he loved middle names, and he called um, his oldest sister Sheila Deborah. I don't think he called her Sheila Deborah Case. Um, in Buffalo, David and I shared a room. It was a bunk beds, but in the 80s, they didn't have any safety rails on the top bunk. So instead of going to sleep, we would get my sister from her room, and we would pull the bunk bed. She would help us, because we were little, pull it slightly away from the wall, and we would take turns rolling off the top bunk onto the bottom bunk using the wall as like leverage. And we would play this nonstop when we were supposed to be asleep. And then, of course, we didn't realize things make a lot of noise. So we would put the beanbag chairs on the ground, and we would leap from the top bunk onto the beanbag chairs. Maybe this is giving you guys a lot of good ideas mm -hmm. for playing, because my dad was all about giving kids good ideas for playing. Um, and um, yeah, so that's what we would do. And then that made a loud thud. So do you think my parents thought we were still sleeping? So, of course, they came up, and they would say, to bed! And then we would scamper up to bed, but what would we do? Would we go to sleep? Yeah, we would go right to sleep, guys. Actually, we would keep playing that game where we would slide off, um, slide off the top bed, and it was just so much fun. We were exhilarated. Um... We would, together, the three of us, make giant forts in the living room. Um, and we would um, jump from chair to chair to couch to floor. The floor was hot lava, so we couldn't touch the floor. Um, it, we called it furniture hop. I think my sister showed us how to play. Um, and then she was in gymnastics, so she showed us how to do dive rolls onto the couch. We would stand up on the arm of the couch and dive roll. All of us would do it. We'd take turns and just go in a roll, and it was like... Um, we created this whole gymnastics um, place anywhere we went. We dump, dumped over all the, like, we had these um, green velvet 1970s chairs. We would just turn them over. We'd make forts inside there. We would just do, my, our parents were like, creative play. You don't have to be perfectly neat everywhere. You can be kids. Um, and so we really, really loved that. We would, um, we had this geodesic dome. We would make forts out of it. We would climb. We, all the neighborhood kids loved to come over. Um, and we would play all the, you know, kids' games, statue and tag and hide and seek. And he would sometimes couldn't be found because he would climb up into the linen closet and hide on the top shelf with, like, blankets and things like that. Um, my, my sister and, and I showed him how to slide down the banister, how to go on our butts down the stairs. Um, she would drag over the couch cushions, put them on the bottom of the stairs, and then we would practice jumping down one stair, two stairs, three stairs, and see how far we could get. Um, and that, and that is one of the game, other games that we played. We were bused to school in Buffalo, and um, we would go to this corner. They would drop us off, and we would walk to this corner store, and we would buy these kind of slush puppy drinks. Um, they were like thirty cents. And we would pick out candy. Um, there was this kind of like open air alcove near the bottom of this train bridge. Um, and it had old furniture and, and we would play in there and then walk the rest of the way home once we were cold. Um, we would also, um, my sister and I and brother, we would get cans. I think in New York it was five cents a can. And we would take our little red wagon and we would pull it to Mesmer's. 
and we would trade it in and get, you know, candy of some kind. Um, he loved really deeply, really deeply. Um, when I went to camp for t- my sister and I both went to camp cause we were a bit older and he put all of our stuffed animals in his bed. So there wasn't really any room to sleep unless he slept on the stuffed animals or the, so when we came back home, we saw the bed filled with them, um, because he missed us so much. When David was in fourth grade, my grandmother was sick. He would visit her every day with my mom and he even climbed into bed with her. He talked to her, but then my great aunt Sid got sick, like also. So they were both in the hospital and I was too overwhelmed. I didn't want to go, but he still went, he went every day and he visited them. So he was not afraid of, of somebody who was old or somebody who was, you know, not feeling well. He was just giving them comfort and love and talk to them. He was a really popular little kid at school in Buffalo, at Campus East Elementary, and at Camp Lakeland. Everyone loved him and wanted to be his friend. He was kind, lovable, super cute. Uh, As you know, blonde curly hair, long eyelashes, big brown eyes, super good at sports. When he was in third through sixth grade, we lived in El Paso. David would ride his bike all around town with his friend Edgar, and he had many adventures. And with JD, another one of his friends, he would take apart and engineer toys. At Roberts Elementary, Coach loved and praised David for his skills in sports and picked him to be team captain. Everyone wanted to be on his team. Yeah, he was that kid. He collected baseball cards and loved figuring out the stats. He'd spend hours doing that. When he was in fourth grade, after everyone went to sleep, we walked out of the house into the backyard with our basketball. We climbed down the rock wall into the empty lot behind our house and crossed the street to his elementary school, Polk Elementary, where they had a basketball court. And we played this basketball game called Horse. Uh, Obviously, we played it again and again until we got cold and tired. And then we climbed back up the rock wall and we didn't... um, We didn't realize, keep your voice down. So we were like laughing, joking, talking really loud. And as soon as he swung his leg over the rock wall, my mom came out, get inside and get to bed. What do you think you're doing? So we were like scared. But of course, at that point, he had his own room. But I think I would often go because he's the one who kept the bunk beds. And I would often go in there and um, we continue playing. And my sister also, um, we moved to Cleveland, we moved um, to Fairmont Boulevard in Shaker, and after school every day, instead of going to Mesmer's like we did in Buffalo, we went to, there was like a deli on the corner, somewhere near Warrensville and Fairmont, and we would stop there. He would buy like a hot dog or some kind of food, and we would go home and we'd watch DuckTales, I remember that very much, and lots of other TV shows. We would just watch lots of TV, and we would eat pudding pops, and we'd probably finish the whole... And, not probably, we would finish the whole box. Um, he picked good friends and kept them. That is something that he really did. He really knew how to select his own society. Um, and um, he chose well. When my mom met Tom, he was 14. And Tom and my mom married when he was 18. Tom has two sons, Dave and John. And I was so glad because David finally got to have little brothers. Even if he did have to throw the tallest, youngest, braggy David Hausman into the pool. The brothers loved to be together. Um, When Dave was 19 and I was 21, my mom took us to Egypt, Israel, and Jordan. And I'll just share a little bit. When we went to Egypt, at some point at the airport, the guards just took him. And we were like, oh, no, we're in Egypt. We should not be in Egypt. And we didn't know what was going to happen, but they took him for a long time. And eventually they let him go and nothing happened. But we were very nervous. And then um, we went to the pyramids. And um, he was he was like, I want to all crawl in. It was like the, a pharaoh's tomb. And he crawled in and he got to experience it. I didn't go because um, it was incredibly hot. And he said, It was good to go in, but it was cramped and very, very hot. And um, so he suggested not to go, but I think I wasn't planning to go anyway. But um, he was brave and he was willing to to have an adventure and to see everything that he could. Um, 
when David grew up, he became really wise and perceptive about social dynamics. And he could both be inside the social scene, um, making everybody laugh and um, being the life of the party, but he had a brilliant understanding of group dynamics. He said it like it, like it was. He was. He was fun to be with. He had a keen sense of humor. And I turned to him when I needed support, advice, clarity, or just to share insights about our family or our lives. He was there for me. I love you forever, David, David Michael Pace, little brother. We're grateful that you shared your life, even though it wasn't long enough. But we're grateful that you shared your life with us. Thank you. Thank you, sweetie. Thank you, Sarah. I want to now call on his friend, Ali, someone who shared David's life for a very long time, his first friend in Cleveland and his best friend. Think where man's glory most begins and ends, and say my glory was I had such a friend. I was thinking of getting this engraved on a bench, but Kramer beat me to it. I'll do my best to keep this speech from devolving into Seinfeld references or Chevy Chase quotes, but you've got to understand that was a mainstay of how David and I communicated. Over 33 years of friendship, we had a rapport based around common interests and likes, of which there were many. I can play memories of him on a seemingly endless movie reel in my head. In high school, Jeff Kane, Kevin Johnson, and myself would congregate in his basement and play Madden for hours on the Genesis, order pizza seemingly every night. But man, Dave would get annoyed if there was too much sauce. That was something he would not stand for. And play endless hours of basketball in his backyard. Over the years, David and I learned many a lesson together. A few of these are as follows. Do not try and drink as much Christmas ale as possible. Bottles are, in fact, an adequate substitute for golf balls. Pete Rose is not an unbreakable code word. And do not continue to bet on the Bills to win a Super Bowl. I'll be happy to share further details on this wisdom with you all over the next couple of days. This next part may come as a bit of a surprise to those of you that knew us. But David and I could sometimes be negative about things. And pretty much we agreed on things to be negative about. To wit, commercials should be avoided at all costs because they are inherently terrible. <laughs> Independence Day is one of the worst movies of all time. And Biggie Smalls is an overrated rapper. Yeah, we said it. But the reality is that David was an overwhelmingly positive person to interact with. He and I did not go to the same undergrad. I went to Case, they went to Beloit. I have no idea who thought 17-year-old David was a good fit for Beloit College. But well, it lasted about a year and a half, which in retrospect is actually amazing. He moved back to Cleveland and subsequently hung out with a lot of my friends at Case. When I told them of his passing, there were multiple remarks about he was such a great guy to hang out with, so much fun to be around. Go to a downtown bar or restaurant with Dave, and there were always a multitude of people that knew him. When he let me into his building, he knew every employee and would stop to chat with each of them. When we went onto the rooftop, he would strike up a conversation with seemingly every resident. For me, personally, David always had a kind or supporting word. He would compliment me on what I was doing professionally, whatever fitness regime I was pursuing, my potential macrowave invention, or on the family I was building, he always had my back, always seemed to agree with me, much to my wife's chagrin, I might add. Her favorite phrases are definitely not, oh, but Dave thinks that, or Dave agrees with me on this. <laughs> David often felt like an extension of my family. My brother Ben lived with him for a number of years and remembers him for his intense, yet somehow jovial tirades. My brother Tristan calls Dave one of a kind and also 
hung out with Dave Hausman. My sister Camilla says she can still hear his laugh. My sister Beth once hit him. My brother Tom knows him as encouraging and aggressively nice, and I love this description of him. My wife Colleen grew to know and love David over the years. At first, it was a lot because Dave and I have a tendency to feed off of each other, and it can be a bit to deal with. I mean, it's a lot of sarcasm, ranting, and pontificating to handle all at once. I get that. But Colleen also saw how much I would light up when I was around David and how much he meant to me. My kids know David as my closest friend. I remember the long hours he spent at my house, house helped me redo our basement. When working for a manufacturing company in his early 20s, and yes, I believe this is actually irony, each year as a bonus, David would receive a Christmas ham. He contributed this to my mom's holiday dinner, and for a period of time, he shared Christmas Day festivities with us. I know those meals are some of his favorite memories, as he often spoke of them to this day. Aside from scoring the Yuletide pork, at the same time, David was working through Hiram to finish his undergraduate degree. Following this, he completed his MFA at Case and graduated at the top of his class. For a time, his stepdad, Tom, would call him Brain perhaps with a hint of mockery because David was pretty sure of his opinions, but also with the truth because David was an incredibly bright and hardworking guy. But what was missing for David was a family of his own. Karina, you were a blessing to him, and we know how much he loves you. You and Ariella are what David was searching for, well, maybe the whole time I knew him. He was a changed man once Ariella was born, and he committed his whole self into being the best father possible. We had many conversations about the importance of being a father, how to handle certain situations with our kids, where the pitfalls lay, and the overall joy of having a family. Ariella, you should always know that your father truly cherished you. In closing, these words surely do not justify do not, ju do not do justice for who David was and what he meant to me. And although I will miss him immensely, and this void will be painful and per perpetual, I am truly grateful to have had such a friend. Thank you, Ollie. Karina? Well, I want to thank everyone for being here. Such a short notice. This was unexpected. And I'm going to try to keep it together, but sometimes it's hard when you guys are being so nice and so kind with your words. So I'm just going to tell you a little bit about David, the David I knew. Um, and this is the, ba the David that I want to remember and I would like you all to remember. When um, I learned that I was pregnant, <laughs> David couldn't stop crying. Also, he wouldn't stop eating. <laughs> especially sweets, and I'm not a sweet person. Um, he went on a trip to Vegas, Dan Kelly right here, um, and he missed our six-week ultrasound. But I recorded it, you know, sent it to him. Well, apparently, and correct me if I'm wrong, David started crying all over Vegas, like literally all over Vegas. Everywhere they would go, there was David sobbing. <laughs> right? Yes? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, when Ariella was born, 
again the crying, right? He was crying more than the person having the child. But, but um, he was not afraid to show his emotions when it came to Ariella. Um, he loved being a father. And he loved that you were a baby girl. Um, the shell, the hardened shell that David sometimes would put up and show the world was completely gone when it came to Ariella. And he just did such an amazing job, right? Ariella, Ariella was his beginning and end, his sunshine, his bear. I personally could have um, gotten luckier to have found such an amazing, wonderful, words don't even do him justice, man and father for our child. He would also amaze me in so many ways as a husband, and I mean, I'm not going to take the whole time, but let me tell you that he was very, very supportive of all my dreams and aspirations. Um, when I began my master's degree, we were still living um, in the suburbs. I am more of a city girl. And um, commuting back and forth was taking way too much time for us. And, and that meant um, I had less time to spend with Ariella. So when I told him, um, David, why don't we just move downtown? Let's sell our house and move downtown. I thought he was going to say, you're insane. Because, you know, we had done so much to our home to make it. <laughs> how you know how you want it. But thank goodness we did because we put it on the market and it sold in like one day. Multiple offers. So I guess my Pinterest home, like many called it, um, paid off. But David was the first one to start packing the boxes and making sure that we were gone out of there as soon as possible so that we could be closer to CSU and that I could spend more time with Ariella. And that's what, but we were as a family, right? Um, we just do whatever it took and that's who we are. It's like, let's just do it, whatever it takes. And most importantly, we ne never cared about what people thought and that was who David was. He would just do whatever he wanted to do, regardless of anyone's opinion. So long as Ariella was taken care of and happy, that is all he cared about. Um, the end. <laughs> Thanks to David's attitude and complete trust that wherever we were, so long as it was just the three of us and happy, Ariella now knows fine cuisine with impeccable mocktails to accompany them. Desserts, she loves to eat all of this exotic food because daddy encouraged it. Um, and she also learned to be kind and noble. But she has sophistication just like daddy, right? Ariella, this is where I might not keep it together. Daddy and I want you to know that he fought until the very, very end, until he couldn't anymore so that he could continue to be here for his bear and for mama. And he also wanted me to tell you something that you are going to understand, perhaps most parents in this room will, and children. Even though I'm not here, I will always be near. We love you so, so much. Remember that your dad was a doer and a fighter. And we are going to be 
the forever, whatever it takes family so that you can be whoever you want to be and continue being a great, great eight-year-old that thinks she's 30. Okay? Well, thanks, everyone. So, my dad was the best that he could do. He did so much for the family. He did everything that he could have done for everything. Dad was awesome. He knew so many people, as you heard. He was like the best dad he could have been. That's really all I could say right now, but he had so much more to do. Thank you, Karina, and thank you, Ariella. And friends, uh, the last family member that I'd like to call on is, is David's brother-in-law, who was more like a brother and a good friend. I'd like to ask Rabbi Nissen and Tyne to please join me. I guess I have to go after Ariella. I don't know how I'm going to do that. <laughs> Beautiful. Thank you, Ariella. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, Ali. Thank you, Karina, for all of your beautiful words. I'm going to speak a little bit about David's relationship to Judaism and also his relationship to the whole family and everyone else. His Hebrew name was David Michael Ben Salma Ita Vijan. And just thinking about David, his first name, we think about David Melech Israel, David the King of Israel. We see, think about the Star of David, we see the star. And I also noticed an Ariella, she's got a beautiful Star of David. Judaism was very important to David. He wasn't much of a religious person. Uh, we had a number of theological conversations in the beginning, um, which ended in a very interesting way. But I do remember about 20 years ago, I think, he spent some time at a yeshiva in Israel called Or Sameach. And the purpose of the yeshiva is to try to make people more religious, more observant. That did not work. But I do believe that David came back much more connected to Judaism because he came back being able to argue about Jewish ideas and to connect in a very, very deep way to all of his family traditions. In fact, even today, this was so important for him to have a traditional Jewish funeral, and that was part of who he was. There's one Mishnah, one rabbinic teaching that all the lines in this teaching remind me or make me think about David, and it's a Mishnah from Pirkei Avot, from Ethics of the Fathers, chapter 2. And in the Mishnah, the rabbis ask, what is the derech yishara, what is the appropriate way adam, that a person should cling to? In other words, what are the most important qualities or traits that we should try to find? And one rabbi says, eye in tova, which means a good eye, a generous eye. David was very, very generous. Ariel is smiling, I know. Anything that he could give you, anything that he can give to Karina, anything that he can give to any of his family members, he was there. The next opinion is chaver tov, to be a good friend. We heard from Ali, but really so many wonderful, lifelong friends that David had. The next opinion is shachain tov, to be a good neighbor. When I think about what it means to be a good neighbor, I think it means people who aren't necessarily your natural friends, people who aren't your family that you at least uh, grow up with, but people you can come across. I think about my own family. David really loved my family and my family loved David. I've gotten so many texts and comments from, from my family members. Miriam, my sister, is here today, but all of them uh, really just having so many wonderful moments. A lot of times it was with a bottle of alcohol, <laughs> um, which David obviously uh, enjoyed and loved to enjoy with other people. 
And the last opinion in the Mishnah, which I think is the most important, and the rabbis say this is the most important quality, is lev tov, which means to have a good heart, a big heart. Actually, yesterday, right after David passed, I was, had a little opportunity to have a little chat with Ariella. And, of course, she was crying. And I told Ariella, and we spoke about how her heart was hurting. But when your heart hurts, what does that mean? That means that there was a lot of love. And there was a lot of connection. And that's why it hurts. So it hurts, but it also feels good in a certain way because it means that you were so close. And David really had that love. And a lot of the family members have been talking about this idea that Ali also referenced, this idea that 10 years ago when David met Karina and then eventually had Ariella, this whole new part of him came out, this lev tov, this deep, giant, beautiful loving heart that we really got to feel. It was there all along, and we got to feel it in such a beautiful way. I just want to conclude. There are five words that we say at a funeral when we think about someone. We say it during the Yisker service. It's actually on a gravestone as well. Five letters. Tuf nun tzadi beiz hei. And it stands for the words, Tehei nishmato tzura b'tzorachayim, which means may his soul be bound in the bond of life. And it's exactly as Karina just gave that beautiful message to Ariella. David, maybe physically, not here, but his soul, his essence, is bound in the bond of life. Who is the life? It's you, Ariella. It's you, Karina. It's this beautiful family. It's me. It's all of us. We are the living, and David's soul is bound with us. David's essence is bound with us. May his soul be bound in the bond of life. In Omar Amen, as we say, Amen. Thank you. Thank you, Rabbi. Thank you, Nisan. Friends, today we join with the sages of our people as we declare the word Zichron Olivracha. We pray that the memory of David Case and all the good deeds that he performed here in the land of the living we pray that these memories will always be for you, a true blessing. At this moment, I invite those of you who are able to rise to please do so for the El Malay Rahamim, the memorial prayer. El Malay Rahamim, Shochen Bamromim. Am Semenu Khan Khona, Taha Kamfe Hashkina. במלות קדושים ותורים, כזוכר הרקיע מזהירים. את נשמת דוד מיכאל בן סלמה איתה, שהלך לעולמו בגן עדן דהמנוחתו. אהנה בהרח עמי מסתירהו, בסתר כנפך לעולמים, ותצרור ביטרור החיים את נשמתו. אדוני הוא נחלתו, וינוח בשלום על משכבו, ונאמר, אמן. O merciful God who dwells on high, who is full of compassion, grant perfect rest beneath the shelter of your divine presence among the holy and pure, who shine as the brightness of the firmament, to our dear David, who has gone now to his eternal home. May David's soul be bound up in the bonds of eternal life, and grant that his memory inspire all of us to noble and consecrated living. And to this we say, Amen. Please be seated. Friends, I would like to share with you just a couple brief announcements. For those of you who are driving in procession with us to the Mayfield Cemetery, our service will continue there. The family will be receiving visitors at the Case Hausman residence at 22650 Shaker Boulevard immediately following the interment at Mayfield Cemetery until 6 p.m. and then again on Sunday from 2 until 4 p.m. as well as in the evening from 6 until 8 p.m. Anyone who wishes to make a contribution in memory of David, the family has suggested that you might consider the Mendel Jewish Day School located in Beechwood. On behalf of the entire family, we thank you for your love for the outpouring of support as you have come here today in peace. May you go forth in peace.
Thank you. 